talk too much, Steve cuts us down. <laughs> but he just does it as well. Yes. <laughs> and we also have the flags. Uh, oh. Be gentle, please. Okay? Now, which one, which one <laughs> means what? Yellow is, that's a little out of hand. Red is, that's way out of hand. But so yellow is a warning. Yeah. Red is, red is like reserved for Harrison. Really uh, thick <laughs> soccer, yellow card, red card. Okay. okay. Everybody, know that? Everybody know that reference? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, who got the read? How many found this week's reading a lot easier than the last two? <laughs> I'm there as well, don't worry. Um, so, getting into that, he's wrapping things up for us in the, uh, in the book. And then objection number nine is God will not allow suffering. This is an objection that people who aren't familiar with Christianity or even want to disbelieve God for some reason. This is one of their biggest things. God won't allow suffering. He's all good God. And the assertion is that mankind suffers. So there, Sproul gives us four approaches to explaining suffering and their basic understanding. Who remembers the first one? Docetic. 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 Yeah, and uh, what is that? It's not real. They don't believe. Yeah, it's an illusion. Not illusion. Illusion. Everything's illusion. Okay. Early Docetism argued that Jesus, Jesus was not really human. Yes. Because suffering's an illusion, and Jesus suffered. That's very interesting. Good. Amy. Is this the same kind of view that is it Hindus? Yes. Hindus have. Well, Buddhist okay, one Hindus, but yeah. Suffering is an illusion. Okay. 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 Yeah. And What's the second one is what? Stoic. 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 What's that? You can read. He describes it as philosophical imperturbability. Right. In, wow. in the layman's term, what is it? They don't, they don't feel anything. Right. Oh, they try not. Suppressing the feeling yeah. of suffering yes. and just like putting up a stiff upper lip. You condition your reactions to suffering. Everybody, everybody remember anybody who's stoic? Yeah. Squawk. British. The British. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, I always heard that when I was little, that they have a stiff upper lip. You, we don't show in the European um, background, true. we do not show, we tend to hold our emotions more back. If you're in the Eastern cultures, like in Pakistan, when people die, there's a lot of wailing, the way it was in the Old Testament. Yeah. And we tend to nice. try to hold it in more. Yeah. And I asked one of my friends from Africa why even among Christians is there so much wailing when the Bible says don't mourn as the unbelievers. She says, well it's because we figure we ought, it's, it's better and healthier to get everything out all at one time. There's something to do that. So that's what they do. Yeah. And they, they really go through you know Pain, agony when somebody dies, fainting yeah. spells, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and beating to the breast. Jump with the coffin. Yeah. Jump on the coffin, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> oh, uh, take me with well, the Immolation in India, right? There's, there's a funeral pyre, the wife goes and jumps on the funeral pyre. Right? Kills herself in the process, yes. Yeah, that's right. Just for a second, coming back to the docetism. Docetism. I believe some. Christian uh, and some denominations um, engage in, oh, don't give voice to that suffering. You know, yeah. Always believing it's the I believe this, I believe that. And claiming, you know, they believe that a lot of the Bible is to avoid suffering. God doesn't want us to suffer. Yeah. In fact, uh, a lady floored me. She was, I thought, a very strong Christian, understand? And I said something about suffering. So oh, God does not want us to suffer. That was a different dispensation. They got <laughs> really upset at me. And that there are people who do. I mean, so I, it was the first time that I, you know, heard that that was not what we should give voice to. Ricky, let's go to. Good, Ricky. Um, I had. I'm going to write you guys. And I, I had a. 
a discussion with a friend of mine, the same guy who was uh, asking me about God in cyberspace. He's an atheist. Uh, Is the guy who did cyberspace? Yeah. Is God in cyberspace? So I spent okay. the whole night there thinking about replying to him. This thing is, is Joe Osteen. And uh, he's telling me that Joe Osteen uh, talking about uh, poor people. Poor people. And people who broke. God really don't like that. And uh, so I had to have an apologet apologetic response, but to cut the long story short, when I started to really think about the word faith guys, mm -hmm. their approach to suffering is that if you really have faith and you exercise the faith force, you shouldn't be poor, you shouldn't be suffering, you shouldn't be sick. In the atonement, God healed, God catered for your healing by your stripes, by his stripes you healed. Mm -hmm. So in a kind of way, even some within Christendom have that uh, some weird, weird views of suffering. Yeah, yeah but if, if, they, if all that is, is true, then we have to take Job out of the Bible. No, of course, of course, Job that was start in Scripture. Yeah. But the, the, I think what he was pointing out to me is that every time they look on the TV, these are the Christians they're seeing. Yeah. And they're, you know, these guys... He said he has a problem with mega churches and, and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So. Let's get back to the Stoics. Conditioned responses. One of the epitome of Stoicism is in a book by uh, McMurtry. Larry McMurtry. Mountain Dove. Do you ever see that? Do you ever see the, you ever see the miniseries? It's four part parts. It's well what worth is, it. What is it? Lonesome, Lonesome Dove. Dove. Oh, I saw part of it. And in it, Tommy Lee Jones plays this guy named Commander Call. Steely eyed, nothing's, nothing's getting going. As a matter of fact, they run into a, a guy they used to know in the Rangers, and they found out that he was running with bandits, so they hung him. And then <laughs> later on, they, this one guy meets up with him again, and he goes, Aren't you uh, friends of Jake's boot? And he goes, Yep. Well, what happened? He said, ran into the crowd, and we hung him. Like, no big deal, we just hung him. It's a, it's a bit of, bit of, that's a really hard, stoic approach to things, okay? Very, very harsh. Non-conditioned. Who said Spock? Yeah, Spock, to a degree. Non-emotional. Yeah. Spock? Huh? Spock? 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 Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Always looking at things logically. Yeah. What's the third one? Hedonistic. What is that? Pursuit of pleasure. It's a... If you have pain, you balance it out with as much pleasure as right. there is pain. Yes. So it's like uh, you're entitled to that pleasure because of the pain. So you, you it's like a, a, a balance. You need a balance. Here. Right. So for all you people who want to be hedonistic, you get up at the night, you go to bed, and you stick your toe, then you go eat the chocolate cake. <laughs> Great idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the justification. <laughs> How about the fourth one? Existential. Yeah. What does that mean? What is the existential belief? Existential belief. Life is meaningless. There's yes. no point to life is probably a better definition. Yeah, there's no point to life. I wouldn't say, yeah. I, that, yeah. Now, the funny thing, they'll point to Nietzsche for this. Nietzsche. Okay? Yeah. They'll point to him for that. Mm -hmm. But in a, in, a, in a way, Solomon in Ecclesiastes yeah, says the same thing, right. does he not? Yeah. Yep. Chasing yeah. after the wind? Very much so. Except till the end. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, all yes. that's like the last, half right. the last chapter. When he finally yeah. analyzes all things, like, yeah, life is meaningless without God. Yeah, you that's better right. read the whole he book. He resolves the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. The whole time, you're like, this is rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> this is rock and roll. This is like the middle of the first chapter of the book. Oh, no, no, no. I was just agreeing. Where he says, you know, all is vain. Yeah. All is vanity. All is vanity. Under the sun. What are the Christian responses? First two, docetism. What would the Christian response be? Suffering is obviously real in the Bible. Yeah, that's exactly right. Christian does not deny suffering. It's real. The Bible never detracts from it. Okay? It will highlight it. It will point it out. Okay? We wouldn't really have a, a, much of an insight as to the love of Christ. 
we didn't point. understand what he suffered for us. And it, it, I think this was very interesting when he said, it does not glorify suffering. The Bible does not glorify suffering. And I think we need to be, we, we, we're a fine wire when we're trying to say, but Christ is glorified on the cross. I don't know. I, mean, <coughs> I, I see where we're going with it. Because I get it. It is through obedience, yes, John. I mean, there are benefits. Yes. There can be recognized benefits. Yes. But you're right, it shouldn't be glorified. Who's played on the sports team? Nobody played on the sports team. Yeah. What do they make you do? Self-conditioning. Huh? Self-conditioning. Practice. Practice, what are you doing? Let's go football. What are you doing in practice? Conditioning, pretty much. Conditioning. Grass drills. How do you do this action in a football game? Don't ask. Hit the deck. Yeah. We never do that football game, but we're doing it every time. You're suffering. But there is a result for it. Yes. What's the game? Well, that's, that's true to a point, too. So, how about the next one? I'm sorry. How would you interpret Melville's quip? You read it? Yeah, until we understand that one grief outweighs a thousand joys, we will never understand what Christianity is all about. This is a personal question for you to oh. contemplate. That's a, that's a pretty tough saying. Who knows who Melville was? One grief outweighs a thousand joys. Until we understand that. What does that mean? One grief outweighs a thousand joys? Well, so, so obviously. That all it takes is one grief. Then I think that's poignant. Yeah, they got to be. Humans <laughs> are more predisposed to negative emotion, uh, psychologically speaking. Do you think? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, that's, a, that's just a fact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you refer to it as a quip, I mean, you're, you're implying there's something humorous. I'm not, yeah. I'm not oh. getting the humor. No, not quite like okay. that. Okay. It's not that, not that kind of well, a quip. No. A quip would be just a throw it out there saying. Oh. I thought it was just like me and my lack of trust in the Lord that. One bad day for Garrett puts me so far back. I'm like, you would think at this age I would not do that. Well, we're all Israelites and we're all in the book of Judges. Going through the cycle of sin over and yeah, over and over. Place. But doesn't it also in a way say that you know, joy, is, not joy, but um, you know, when we have a pleasant experience, they're fleeting. They are. They're, they're kind of fleeting. Um, where grief gets down to the, to the bottom of your heart. I mean, it's yeah, like, seriously. It's I more mean, profound. It's, gotcha. I mean, another way to look at it, this probably isn't the direction he was taking it, but the end does not justify the means. So you okay. can't cause grief, you know, ethically in order to produce joy. Yeah. That would be an unethical. So you're not immoral. telling me that God's causing grief to. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, he could use grief. Yeah, there's no yeah. doubt. But well, that, that goes back to not glorifying suffering. That's Some right. people do think, well, if, you know, then I'm going to suffer, just, you know, put myself through suffering. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's sort of artificial. Correct. Ricky. But the Bible tells us that our afflictions now, momentary, can be light compared to the weight of eternal glory and they're working for us in eternal glory. So we consider, we persevere, consider yes. pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, for the testing of your faith must produce perseverance, perseverance must produce character, character must produce hope. So even though I understand that you don't glorify it, we live in a fallen world and there's going to be suffering. And suffering started from the moment Adam sinned and it's going to stop when Christ comes back. Correct. So then the Bible is telling us that we must understand and interpret our suffering in light of future glory, or else we cannot really know how to live life now. Right. We always got to consider the, 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 the um, what, what do you say, the glory, the glorification that we're living for. And God working us. The ultimate end. Yeah. Yeah, our reaction to it should be that way. Yeah, you know, that's what this is like. saying is don't go out. I think we all know this. Going through the suffering, but it's hard to remember sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> That's a good point. I think the um, what is the, the apologist said there's an intellectual problem of suffering, 
and then there's the experiential thing. Correct. Yep. Intellectually, yeah, what I just said was more intellectual. Yes. Uh, but it's interesting that the Bible keeps feeding you it because they want you to also move, move away from just the raw experience. But of course, we don't want to tell people, forget about it, this is nothing. You know? right. We don't want to make light of it. All right. Good thinking, guys. How about stoicism? What's our Christian response to stoicism? We're not called to be Stoics, according to Sproul. Yeah. That's not the example of Christ. Is what? It's not the example of Jesus. What? That's not how he behaved. He wasn't just imperturbable all the time. He got mad, he cried over Lazarus. That's right. Knowing full well he was going to resurrect him in five seconds. What did you say? Well, I read from here, it says Christians are not called to be Stoics. We're not, we're not called to just... Uh, in the midst of pain and suffering, to just keep that steep up, up, up the lid, that he says. Right. So, yeah, that's right. We need to grieve over the suffering. Christ grieved over Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Now, did Christ know he was going to bring him back? Yeah. yeah. Of he did. Why are you crying? Sure. Because, because we're close. supposed to grieve over Because suffering. they were close. Yeah. He visited them. They were his close friends. They were close friends, family. yeah. Yes. And you've just lost somebody. I'm, I'm going to enter into your suffering. Well, speaking of Jesus, I mean, when he was preparing to go to the cross, if he was a stoic, he would not have said, Father, if it's possible, take this mm -hmm. out away. Yeah. He would just took a step up her lip and said nothing, right? Yeah, yeah, he would just, just mm -hmm. oh, I'm tough. I Good say. point. I think the overarching problem of stoicism from the Christian perspective, is that you lose your humanity. I think you're right. Who knows who Elihu is in the Bible? Who knows what? Elihu. One of Job's friends. Yeah. Um, One of Job's friends. He's the last one to speak. He's stoic all the way through. The other guy's saying, well, you must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Or there's sin in your life. Somebody, you know, uh, did, you, did your sons do something wrong? They're all doing all this. And he's just remaining quiet. He's remaining very stoic. Then he opens his mouth. That was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> 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 the, the, the problem I think too with stoicism is, especially you know, well for anyone, but particularly for a believer, is it's a form of control that you're exerting, and you're not depending on God to help you deal yeah. with with your pain, your emotions. It's it's a form of control. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of saying, you know, God, I got this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. What are three things that have no true relation to grief? Born to roll. There is no sin. Sorrow, bitterness, and hostility. Well, I put them, I reversed a couple of them, but it's okay. <laughs> Sorrow and hostility. Somebody's grieving and they start tearing the place apart. That's bitterness. Mm. Something else is going on. It's not, it's not the sorrow that's got you. It's not the, not the grief. Mm -hmm. Right? Sorrow. It's okay to cry. There's, that's, that, that's not necessarily the same sorrow. Let me get back to the sport thing. Let me get back to that one more time because it's so, so poignant. You win the Super Bowl and you, they, you talk to people about this. It's like, we won it. And the next day it's like, okay. <laughs> no. But lose the Super Bowl, you're carrying that for a whole year. Think about it. It's just the way it is. The human part. I don't understand that. What? I don't either, because I didn't get to read this chapter. What are three things that have no true relation? Those things do happen in grief. Well, they do. Right. But from a godly perspective, bitterness, you should not be bitter because you lost somebody. But the bitterness, it's walking through the grief. It's not really, it's, it's to me, it's part of the sorrow. And the anger is part of it, too. Yeah. Well, I walked through all of those. I know we do. Yeah. I'm not saying we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I I see it that God takes me through those that process if I allow Him, or I can stay in anger. And I think that's and, what He's getting at. Okay. In, in yeah. the book, go ahead. I mean, there's okay. a difference though between anger and hostility. Um, you know, anger is not. The Bible doesn't say anger is wrong. The Bible says that we need to be careful with anger. Because it can lead to other things like bitterness and hostility. 
And sorrow, there's two different kinds of sorrow. There's there's godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, and there's worldly sorrow, which, which just leads, leads to shame and crushing guilt it's and, kind of and what depression. You said a ago, right? Yeah. Because of lack of faith, then it becomes about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because, I think you're right on the on the money with it. We have to allow God to work through it all. And but we do. There's no doubt that we do it. We do as as fallen people fall into these things, but it's not what God would want. God would want us to have to go through grief purely. And yes, you can have anger. I mean, that's a natural mm-hmm. healing. Jesus had anger yes. without sin. But we're going to struggle and we are going to fall. But those things, if we give into those things, those things, uh, in addition to our grief, can take us down a dark, dark mm-hmm. spiral. And consume us as well. Yeah. It, pushed, it pushed me to God. Yeah, that's good. I, can, that's I can tell and yell at God. He sure. understands our yes, feelings and what that's we're right. dealing with. That's what Psalms is. So yes. when it was happening with me, I didn't I didn't know you know, you're going I, I was angry. Why was I so angry? Yeah. You know, why are people still walking around and they're alive and my sister's not. You know, I, I went through that process. Mm-hmm. But it was a process. Yeah. It was it a is. process. And God just listened, you know He's yeah. not gonna, you right. know. Right. He can handle our pain. Exactly. He can, he handle, can handle my pain. He can redirect. How about That's the right. hedonistic uh-huh. point of view? What's the our answer? Of our That's right. What is the uh, hedonistic? What is our answer to the hedonistic point of view? Yoler. Oh, what? What are you oh. saying? That the, the, the one with the balancing response. What's the balancing act? He's sick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys I'm are sorry. sick. Yeah, I'm not sorry. But, John! Yeah. Well, I think the answer Amy gave a minute ago kind of applies to this one. Well, I don't, I know how to control it. I have, you know, drinking or drugging or whatever, I can control my, uh, my suffering. Yeah. Our Christian response is it kind of goes hand in hand with the Stoicism. I mean, I think of our current culture. Do we uh, do we find ourselves if it's not you know uh, if we're not in in partaking of maybe to excessive whatever food alcohol whatever uh, do are we are we binging on Netflix what, we and, even see, you know, we I mean, even do we know. these things you know we go to as for pleasure I mean even like I love to read and good literature, but I sometimes have to stop and say, wait a second, you know, am I escaping? You know, yeah. it's an escapist response. You're right. Yeah. Well, we see, And we can do it many ways. We see people who refer to themselves as shopaholics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just yep. go shopping. Stress. Get over stress. Yeah. My yeah. wife and I talk about stress. If, if we're sad, we eat. Mm-hmm. Because we're sad, if we're joyful, we eat. Yeah. Yeah. That's our problem. Really? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you don't want to heap pleasures on top to compensate for suffering or pain. Diane. I'm sorry I burst it out like that. No. Well, no. First, first I want to explain because after. You can get a you, yellow flag you go in. <laughs> well, come out. Well, well, if you had a yellow flag, would it make you feel better? <laughs> Well, this, that's what we do here, though. I, that's how we I've do. seen that word you as, you know, as, you know, grotesque sin, you know, hedonism. Okay? But when you guys started explaining it, I do that. Yeah. We all do it. We all do it. We all and do God, it. in fact, this week, you know, as I'm growing in my faith, I realized after speaking with someone... And her seeing the scripture differently than what I'm being taught or what I'm believing. And I hang up and I think, I want to go shopping. Because shopping has been my, uh, uh, it's a book for me. Yeah. It's a, it is a, a book. And also our eat or I need to go get a malt or get a shake or, you know. And But I stop. I said, Lord, I see it. I see it. He showed me. It was so awesome to say, no, I'm not going to go there, Lord. I'm going to go into prayer. I'm going to go into your word. Yay, God! It was so cool. Because before, I wasn't seeing that when you're in the midst of it. I, I never really saw it, but I didn't know it was hedonistic. 
but now I understand. Hate this is more love of the self than anything else. Yes. That'd be the okay. truth. Okay. Is, is this where we get the term heathen? Yeah. Heathen. Yeah. Heathen. Is no, it sort of no. a, a, a variation on heathen and it's oh, heathen? No. What is heathen? That's a good question. That's your report for next week. Yeah, really. Heathen? Heathen is like <laughs> heathen. Heathen is H E A T H E N. I know, but I mean over time. Like the, oh, I see. Heathen. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. We'll, we'll find I mean, out. Chris is going to tell us in okay. a little bit, okay? I got you. Okay, you go. So what question is begged from the hedonistic approach? In other words, if you're going to, talk, if you're going to pile on pleasures to compensate for suffering, what question does this beg? It begs a question. It's not in the book. Well, I want you to think it was in the book was that Luther talked about it, and he, and he admitted, it, and he said it was in parentheses, that he would go out and get drunk yeah. to cover up his... And I guess the I'm not sure what the answer is, uh, but it's you, you're in denial when you do it. Okay, thank you, Joe. Well, I mean, a habitual approach to suffering and doing this is we don't need God. The the pleasure becomes the idol, the mm. go-to. That's good. And so it, it can lead us away from depending on God. And, you know, recognizing the situation and just sort of trying to drown it, and after a while, it, it it's um, that's our God, all right. All right. Then, go, John. Does that actually remove the pain and suffering? Oh, that's a, that's another great question. You might even ask further: Does it cause it? <sighs> that's what I was going to bring up. Lots of people. It's like the, what the verse: People have wandered away from their faith in search of money and pierced themselves. Man. Yep. Lots of people have wandered away in search of happiness right. and, have, and have compounded their suffering. Yeah. Well, this is like with alcohol. That's right. Yep. Or anything. So yeah. we pick on drugs and alcohol, but there's a gajillion things people they, yeah. they do. They just, all great questions, to, guys. I was thinking more on this. <laughs> if too much pleasure, do you invite more suffering then? Well, that's kind of what we're saying. Yeah, that's, what we're saying. That's, that's a good question. I mean, you're supposed to balance if, it. If, if it's a balance. If it's a balance, are you inviting more suffering then? Yeah, because you're outweighing yeah. your pleasure. And I think that's but all, I mean, all those questions were poignant right on. So that's good. But I think so, yes, to an answer to that, because uh, God is a jealous God, and he's not going to, to let us uh, find satisfaction in something that's an idol, that's unworthy. This would be true. We you see know? that with Pharaoh, don't we? Hmm? We see that with Pharaoh, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just... How and about so the for any of us who've tried to do this, I think most of us have found that... It's pleasurable for a moment, yep. but in time, we're like, it's a moment's insane. over. <laughs> How about the existential? What's our response to the existential? Life does have meaning. Sin is duly linked to suffering. There's not one to one. It's not one to one. Just because somebody is suffering, you cannot point to some sin in their life. Christ shows that, right? Is this person blinded because of his sins or his parents? Neither. Okay? That suffering was not due to any sin. It was just the glory. So God would be glorified through Jesus. Okay. I, Good. I have the definitions for heathen and heathenist. Good. Um, a heathen is a person who does not belong to a widely held religion. And then a heathenist is somebody... Yeah, a person who believes that the pursuit of pleasure is the most important thing in life. Yeah. Does it give an origin on heathen? Let's look. Amy's not giving up this point. She's, she's I'm just it. curious because... I love it. Don't worry about it. All right, you can continue. I'll look up the... <laughs> While he's doing that, can I make it's a okay. Yes. I believe, I believe yes. R.C. does say that all suffering is a sin. result of sin. It's linked to sin. However, personal suffering right. is not necessarily linked to Which would be true, because sin. all sin comes into, into existence right. when? Right. right. All 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 right. The so that, yeah. that's a little that bit true. wordy. Okay. Like yeah. All right. According to Sproul, and as it applies to Christian responses, what's the wrong question that people ask? Why did the tower fall on those presumably innocent people? Yeah. The wrong question to ask is, why do others suffer? Right. What's the right question to ask? Why, why don't we suffer more? Why, why, why? Need to, 
Yeah. Why, why, why suffer? No. Why do I not suffer? Why do I not suffer? You've all heard this before, right? I mean, if the result of sin is death and we all sin, what do we have? Okay. Did you, did Why you, am I not suffering? Why are they suffering? Why not me? That's the right question. And that, you got to be careful because that will take you into stoic waters. It could very easily do that. Did you know Rogers puts it this way? He said people are loud, often asked. He was doing a, a sermon in Romans 8, 28. Um, all things work together for good. He said, a lot of people ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? And he said, the question to be asked is, why do good things happen to bad people? Or anybody. Because right. we are bad, there's right. no good person. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> only, only, what, what are you supposed to say? Only, only bad things only ever happen to one good person and he volunteered? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's there you go. That's a better one. happened one time and he volunteered. <laughs> Do it a little louder so she can hear you on the recording. Well, I forget who I said, said, I heard say that. He said, people say, why do bad things happen to good people? And the, the response was, that only happened one time and he volunteered. That's it. Okay. Perfect. There's no good for us. That might be brought to you. Why does the complaint of injustice work on the horizontal plane but not the vertical plane? Horizontal amongst humans, vertical between man and God. Why does it work on the horizontal plane but not on the vertical plane? Injustice. The complaint about it. Joe. Well, I mean, we see injustice in a horizontal way. Is you got something I didn't, and said, so it's related to sort of relative, if you will, to what we see each other. But with God, He is not capable of injustice. So it's sort of a perfect. That's a wrong question. It's a, it's a warped view of God to uh, assume or believe that He is engaging in injustice. We, we are unjust to each other as humans. God, as part of his character, cannot be unjust. Just uh, to go back to a previous class, mercy is considered outside of true justice. Justice, correct. So that would be the one exception, but we're not going to complain about God's mercy. No, That's we right. never do, right? Never complain about the mercy. That's right. This is kind of the wrong question again. Because God is just, but we don't really, I mean, the more we understand God, we don't really want his justice. I know. Well, yeah, but we want a, his mercy and his yeah. grace. Right. Well, we but, but in the overall we scheme, deserve. but in his overall plan, he exacted his justice. In other words, his son paid for yep. That's did. That's how he, you know, that's how his whole True. equation True. works. Yeah, individually. We don't deserve. We don't stand a chance. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. At Christmas time, ask, ask somebody after Christmas, "Hey, did you get what you deserve?" <laughs> <laughs> and then some will yeah. get it, and others. <laughs> Someone got what I deserve. It wasn't me. When does trust really get put to the test? During suffering. Nikki like said, "When you don't know why you're suffering." Perfect. When God does not reveal the why of suffering. And Job. Job. Joseph. 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 He suffered tremendously. Without knowing the why. Without knowing why. But why he figured he it out in the end, but Job never really did. But Joseph did <laughs> trust, didn't he? Yeah. He did All trust. The way All the way through, he never raised his fist at God. Daniel trusted, too, all the way through. Yes, Lions Daniel. Daniel. He still That's down. right. Into the fire that his three friends trust all the way through. Yes, you often think, though, about Joseph. I mean, he was a punk kid, you know? <laughs> he was a what? He was a punk kid. Punk, punk kid, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, he, was he, was he was a spoiled was. brat. Like, this is what she oh, said. Oh, yeah, I know. He was Isaac's favorite. Maybe yeah, so that, that kind kid. of helped him to, to reflect when he was going through some yeah. of his trials. And it could be. You know, I we're really right. was a, you know, a we punk to my brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really we're like, my dad gave me the best coat and everything, you know, he showed favoritism to and I was just like rubbing it in their face, mm -hmm. kind of thing. But I think maybe that helps sustain him, knowing that there was sin on his part. You know what I mean? Yeah. That could have led to some of his suffering. It's a good question. Well, when uh, he revealed his it would help his me. dream to his brothers, really he wasn't like right. saying it to rub it in their faces. He literally was telling them right. what the revelation was in the yeah. dream. Right. 
And they saw it as, okay, now you've taken it way too far. You know, like that that was like the straw in the camel's back. You know, they said, we got to deal with this kid. Yeah, that's how he was perceived. And he's reading me. I don't know. I don't lines. think he was a, but, a pure heart. But, <laughs> yeah, the Bible, don't, the Bible don't tell us that. she's got to get put because no, none of us are. So. Yeah, yeah, the Bible didn't tell us that. So uh, uh, we could infer that. But when the Bible clearly said this guy was chosen, he was a favorite, just like Israel, God won. And, and, and the Father was showering blessings on him. They didn't like him. Right. And then he's talking innocently, but they see this as he's boasting, and they come at him. Yeah. Yeah. It happens so often in life. I've always thought shame on that father for playing favorites. But that's yes. what it is. It goes back <laughs> to the father. Was it really Joseph's fault? It's, not, it's right. not right. Or was it his father's creation? No. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, like yeah, like yeah, like yeah, think about that. I mean, Jake, there, there can be legitimate reasons to show favoritism over a child. And in this case... He sent Joseph to go check on his brothers. Why do you think he sent somebody to go check on his brothers? Maybe in the past they weren't doing things that they were wanting. They were <laughs> doing. If yeah, they were that's a good one. Yeah, he may have tattled on them. Yes. Yes. But if there's not something to tattle on. <laughs> yeah, but then that yeah. just shows that his father had a distrust for his other children, but he trusted Joseph. That can work both ways. Yeah, it could know. work both ways in Joseph, too. Could give him a small uh, Yeah, but, you know, yeah. again. It would for most young people. It would. All right, what is suffering in the hands of God? It's redemptive. Fully redeemable in the hands of God. Your suffering, throw it in God's hands. It's fully redeemable. Jesus stated, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody know this? In this world you have trouble. There you go. What can we do if that is true? Be so. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you say? Don't go home. Go back to the beginning. Let's do it again. I don't want to do the work. Another way. Another way. Throw it at him. Try it harder. Rejoice in suffering. Oh, it's a red flag too. That's a red flag. Rejoice in suffering, even not knowing why. Okay. If what Christ said is true. Rejoice in the suffering. Okay? Count it on joy. Yeah. Now, what if it's not true? What can we do? This is a great answer. Sleep, 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 sleep in tomorrow. Sleep in, yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't even matter. <laughs> yeah, on, on the whole issue of suffering, um, as I reflect on it and such, it, it, it's caused me more to, yes, say, God, this is unpleasant, and if it's your will, you know, but if not, what what do you want me to learn from this, or how yeah. what, how do you want me to grow? I think too many times we are, don't don't reflect on that and, and always want to, hey, make it nice and, and you know, remove this and yeah. you know, make it unpleasant, um, where we need suffering to grow. I mean, there are, those are the times when we really... You know, seek God and and to and to reflect on His goodness. And and uh, most of the time, it's it's the reverse of, of grief is 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 coming to realization of how good. I mean, how how much to be thankful. In other words, how yeah. much He blesses us, even in the suffering. Uh, Joe, you sound like C.S. Lewis. <laughs> God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. Good point. Good. 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 We'll wrap that one up. Objection 10, the last, cha the last chapter. Dead is dead, there is nothing more. If death is the final destination, what does life become? Cruel, a rather common there. A cruel, mocking joke. Shake a spear. What would life mean if, I mean, really? It doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. So I stole 20 bucks from you. Who cares? Back to it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. so, I'm sorry, it doesn't steal 100 from you. Yeah. 
No, don't think that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there, Chris. I'm glad John stepped out for that note. <laughs> the assertion. Nature teaches that death is final. That's the assertion the outside world has for us. Nature teaches that death is final. What was Socrates' vision of life after death? What did he, what did he believe? What did he show in nature that, that that can't be true? It's an ongoing cycle. Of what? Of winter to spring, to like summer to fall, like, you know. Seasons. Uh, yeah. Spring. Everything blooms. Everything's nice. Summer, it endures. Fall, it starts to decay. Winter, it dies. And guess what happens next? It comes right back. Spring. Everything's new. Everything's reborn. That's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Give something to Okay. Right. How did Plato expand on Socrates? Remember? Yeah, he talked about like seed. You know, the seed has to die to make the plant. And yeah. The miller has to die to make a butterfly. That's where we're going. He gave a bunch of analogies. From seasons, he looked at the butterfly. We all know the story, right? Caterpillar crawling along, goes into its cocoon, comes out this, and dies in the cocoon. Comes out this glorious, beautiful butterfly. Right? That's life after death. The acorn falls off of the oak tree, the live oak tree. Hits the ground, and the squirrel doesn't get it. <laughs> goes in the ground, dies, and does what? Makes an oak tree. Makes an oak tree. I thought that was interesting, too, his description of that, how it not only dies, it decays. Yeah. It runs. Has to get to the inner seed, which means all of us, all the stuff on the outside, is got to decay to get the inner seed of our soul. Okay? What are the drawbacks of that analogy? There is a drawback to that analogy. In the Christian world, we believe we die, we are resurrected, and then what happens to us? New body. Okay, what else? New births. How long do we live? We live forever. For eternity. Eternity. Eternal. Butterflies do not no, live forever. <laughs> and I don't know if they're in heaven. So I don't have... so. What was Kant's perspective? Pers 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 Say that word. <laughs> Regarding ethics, morals, and justice. Anybody remember this? This was interesting. It was interesting. What was it? There has to be, uh, for, for ethics to have any meaning, there has to be justice. Yes. This is what, like, this is kind of George Peterson. Yes, exactly. Lives as if there is a God. Lives as if it's also, what was it, Pascal's wager? Or uh, Dennis Prager, same thing. Hey. You, there's people who think, you go, do you believe in this? If it's true, they don't think of, that's the wrong question. You act as if it's true. Right. Which is crazy, because he... And going off the cons, what are three things that must occur for justice to ultimately win in the end? Three things. We have to survive the grave. Yeah. There has to be a judge, and then there's judgment. The three judge things. has to be omniscient. We're coming up to that. You just right. jumped the gun. The judge has characteristics. We must have <laughs> He will judge me. We're walking, we're not running. In the afterlife, whether, I was, ready, whether, whether I was out of line or not. <laughs> Wait, the three things were what? Right there. There right. must survive the grave. There must be a judge. There must be a judge. And there must be, judge, okay. and there must be judgment. Okay? Fill in the blank. A perfect judge must be nothing less than John. No, not nothing less than John. What's the word? Omniscient. Omniscient. Why? He would be a perfect judge if he's not omniscient and doesn't know everything. He could make a mistake. Yep. And so you would not get perfect justice. Perfect. Very good. Fairness. What was Kant's conclusion? Anybody remember this? Did we get this? Kant's conclusion. You, the argument doesn't prove that there is a God, but from a practical perspective, it makes sense that you should live as if there is one. Mary. Well, the book just says, we must live as though 
there were a God, for Kant, life was intolerable without a solid basis for ethics. If death is ultimate, then no ethical mandate is really significant. Yeah. There's no meaning to ethics if we're living like there's no God. Amen. Well, I thought it was interesting that he, he came that, you know, that there's really the two options, and he chose the more positive, yeah. which yep. is either life is meaningless and she couldn't tolerate that thought, or there's theism. Well, by theism. Yeah. Or well, we need to live like there is. It's just his preference. Yeah. 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 It, if it's not true, it's just his preference. That's right. Yeah, that's the scary so, like, part. So, like, chocolate ice cream, but no. This is similar to uh, Blaise Pascal. Yes, it is. He said something yeah, similar is. that if, if you got a choice, you, you're not sure if there is a God or there isn't a God, why not bet on there is one and, right. and follow his, his uh, rule? What do you got to lose? Using the two points of believing or not believing in God, either eternal damnation or eternal glory. Right. Why would you not bet with eternal glory? Why would you go? Why would you bet on eternal damnation? This is a very interesting point. What if life is meaningless? What if it is meaningless? Hmm? We have nothing to lose. Is it that? So By believing there's a God. Yeah. You mean. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You need to go have some fun. What if life <laughs> is meaningless? Yes. Because what happens? God help. Because he relates these three things in the book: Macbeth, the seventh seal, and the raven. Mm -hmm. In all three, chaos reigns. Poe is desolate at the end of the raven because the answer is when will I, when will I be reunited, reunited with Lenore? Yeah. Nevermore. You're not being reunited. No, forget it. Now, I've often thought that, too, if, if atheists um, truly believe that life is meaningless, why are there any atheists? <laughs> yeah, they don't I, act it you out. You know, I mean, I truly, it would lead me to suicide. Yeah, I don't well, understand. And, you like, know, not that I want that for them. We actually have a real but, problem. There's a, I mean, there's a growing suicide. Statistically, that's a real, that's a problem. That is a problem. It's a problem. Jumps. Yeah, it, it leads to hedonism, but ultimately, I mean, but that if you think about pleasure in a way that right. dopamine works, to, to actually yeah, right. condition yourself to get a higher dopamine yeah. fix, yeah, it does like lead to that. Yeah. 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 Have you ever seen Groundhog Day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think I counted at least 30 days of whatever. You know, at first she's like, is this for real? I'm going crazy. Then it's like, Hey, this is great. I'm going to do whatever I want. Right. It doesn't last. And then finally, what does he end up doing? He ends up doing, even though he knows it's going to continue, he's going to have to do it all over the next day, he ends up making himself better. And I think that's just the way we go. He ends up doing the right thing. Right. If he was in there for, if you, if you read the, the thing, uh, there's, who do I see preach a sermon on this? Like, uh, but, but, but he, he was supposed to be in there for like a couple hundred years. He was in there for a long, it takes a long time to get past the, Dropping the toaster over in the bathroom. Okay. Learn, Ricky. Right, right, right. Play the piano. Yeah. Ricky. Right. Yeah. Um, my friend said here, uh, I'm going to take some excerpts. Um, he said, I'm with Brother Marx on this issue. Religion at the scale, at scale as the opiate of the masses. So I, I, I said, this is this morning, yours is no more Rand Courtney. Your attack on Joel Osteen has now turned into an attack on all religion. He's just a door through which you want to sneak in and discredit. You're basically looking at him and throwing the baby out with the bad water. You're using the feelings and feelings of men to discourage any pursuit of meaning and purpose in life, or any genuine pursuit of the one true God. How do you answer the life key questions? Origin, where do I come from? Meaning, for what purpose am I here? Morality, how should I now live? Destiny, what happens to me after I die? What is the meaning and purpose of life in your world? If there is no God, what is wrong with Joel, your best life now? If there is no God, then there is no objective standard of good, and there is no objective wrong with Joel or people inventing their own purpose and meaning. Mm. My question for you as my lifelong friend is, was Jesus a fraud? That is the question I invite you to responsibly investigate and answer in your heart. 
and stop looking at the failures of imperfect men to abandon pursuit of a relationship with the only morally perfect one. Excellent. You're going to send that to me. Okay. okay. Good job. Very good. Right, just as an aside, anybody suffering uh, from uh, anxiety, Long insomnia, just just watch the seventh seal. And, uh, <laughs> take care of it. Really? Oh yeah. Is it what is the seventh seal? Uh, it's, it's a movie. Oh, okay. now I gotta watch How did Paul address skepticism in Corinthians? First Corinthians. <clears throat> How did he address that? Can we sum up in, in a quick sentence? If your price of this hasn't been raised, let's go the other, let's go the other way. He explained that Christ was resurrected. Yes. If Christ so we have hope. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. He gave a summary of the evidence. Right. He gave a summary of the evidence for Christ. Appeared to, appeared to the disciples. Yeah, this appeared to 500 one time right. and then lastly to me. Right. He showed us we have hope. Okay. Now, according to Apostle Paul, what if Christ is not resurrected? We're back to Ecclesiastes and all is chasing after the wisdom. Our faith is vain. He's still in our sins. We're still yeah. in our sins. I mean, more, be less, more pity. Needs to be pity. Yeah. Well, it's coming up too. You guys are just running. Yeah. You're running to the finish line. Come on. He's not wrong. What was the bewildering paradox Sproul experienced around the birth of his oh, son? Oh, that was terrible. What a terrible? His mother died Harper. the next morning. Yeah. Or she died in the night. He found it the next morning. Birth and death in short order. And even Sproul. Wow. Here we go. We're, we're, we're back to our suffering again, right? Yeah, Sproul, yeah. with all of his knowledge about this, all the things he's writing about, in his own mind at the, at the moment, in the in the grief, says, "This does not make sense." Existential angst. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I want to die like like my grandfather did in his sleep, and not like the passengers in the car that were screaming and yelling. I agree. Wow. <laughs> it took him a minute to get oh, it the car. <laughs> it's, it's John, John will be John. Uh, John Clemente will be appearing at the comedy club. Yeah, really. <laughs> if Christ is not raised, what would be the position of the Christian? Ricky already said it. I know. We should be pitied above all. Why? Why should we be pitied above all? We hope in nothing. We hope in nothing. <coughs> How does Paul expound on Kant's conclusion? Remember Kant's conclusion. Paul expounds on it in Corinthians, and he says this, Christian. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to uh, Cephas, then to twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of us whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one ultimately born, he appeared um, also. Untimely. Oh, untimely born, he appeared also to me. There's a whole bunch of people here, okay? Yep. That anybody could have gone and said, Did this really happen? There's not one denial in all the first century writings. Not one. That it, saying that it didn't happen. And Paul gives us a lot of hope. So. Using Paul's explanation, how does Jesus answer Ravens nevermore? Forevermore. Forevermore. Isn't that a great place to be? That was a great ending. Yeah, very good. Forevermore. When will I see Lenore again? Forevermore. This is like, this is uplifting. It really is. Okay, general discussion. Anybody want to just start with their thought through this book? What they got? Nobody. Well, I thought it was pretty <laughs> awesome because uh, every question of each chapter was, you know, incredibly difficult questions. And, and he gives, you know, honest answers. He doesn't give, uh, what's the right word? Patterns, churchy clarity. answers, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, just trust in God, and you know, everything will be hunky dory. Right. You know, He gives you real 
thought. And also the whole idea of bringing in philosophers like Kant and so on. Yes. Uh, you know, and even quoting uh, the Raven. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty I remember, I remember doing that in high school. I had no idea what it was about. It's a love song. With hopelessness. Joe. Well, I mean, just R.C. doesn't disappoint because he is um, obviously so knowledgeable in the Bible and reading it in context of theology. And other, but he's very disciplined in his thought process. Mm -hmm. It's how he thinks out the issue and then how he lays out a response. And it's, yeah, sometimes he's a little bit heady, no, but... But but it, it's it's accessible. I mean, it's it's very accessible because he doesn't throw out things as you're saying that that are just well, just trust in that. Yeah. He explains it very well. I, I thought it was it's it's a very very good book. I, I appreciated that even when he was trying to answer the main questions, um, he would he would offer up other objections. Then yeah. I was like, oh, wow, I even thought of that. You know, oh, that is sticky. Oh, gosh, I don't even know why he's thinking of that, you know, <laughs> yes. kind of thing. And it's more like there's like 30 questions that he's answering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he didn't shy away from yeah. any of that. And some of those questions, to be honest, I was like, well, uh, what is that? You know, I, I, some of it was not accessible to me, okay. um, but much of it was. You're not alone. Anybody else? Wow. It was deeper than I expected. Deeper than you expected. There was there were some really hard things to grasp, especially in the last previous two chapters. Uh, yes. Like <laughs> there was questions I haven't even thought to occur. To yeah, thought to think to ask. Um, I do like how in depth that his objections were. That's one of the one of the signs of a really good knowledgeable person is when the objection, like they hold harder objections to their own ideas than others do. A uh, tremendous intellectual honesty. Yeah. yeah That's definitely. what I really admire. Yeah, it's like, well, can a liar be a Christian? It's not your question. <laughs> what's, your t what's your question? You got to get them down to the point where it's, can a sinner be? And then there's no other kind. So. Tiffany, you have any insight? John? A lot of good questions. I wish I'd had more time to go on. Oh, get your own book next time. <laughs> <laughs> I lost mine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my <laughs> the accusations fly. Here. I read for every week but today. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany's the only flag now. Ricky! Yeah. You know, RC is a guy that, um, because I or you know, almost depth of gratitude for my growth as a Christian and as an apologist. If you listen to him on, the, on his Renewing Your Mind broadcast, you basically see the same things in this book. Yeah. So if you, if, if the book didn't surprise me because everything he says here, he says in those broadcasts. And yeah. He has a very good one where he goes through philosophers. He has a good series, like a 50, where he just starts from, from from the Greek philosophers all the way oh, that's and, true. That's and true. ties it in nicely to Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. He's very good at consequence of ideas. Yeah. Consequence yeah. of yeah. ideas, yeah. yeah. Very easy. And of course, uh, um, um, Linda is a, another fan of ours. Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, she talks a lot about that. Yeah. So he has that book too. And he has a, a, a if you call them, they give you the, um, the, the uh, book. And they, you can write the questions, the answers to the questions. He has a whole series of it. Okay. So this is pretty much our study guide for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, RC yeah. is also fiercely trying to persuade you about his view of things. No so doubt. even though he's going through all those things, he's trying to pull you. And there are areas when RC tried to pull me in a certain direction I didn't go. Mm -hmm. See, it's just you, you could see, but he's so clever. Uh, you know, he wants you to be worried about well, why did Adam sin? My question to RC in the garden, you know, because RC is getting there too. There's no spontaneous choice, right? He's a determinist. So yeah. he's like, what? There must be some 
scars all things before Adam sin, and he can he can see that at the, at the very beginning. So he's telling you that if you go with a free will theodicy, you might get into trouble with people making God the author of evil. Yes. So he just he just stays away from it. So he's, you know, and, and of course the free will guy would say, well, he had free will. He had the option of choosing or choosing otherwise. Uh, but you see how clever he, he, he he's, he's, he's very good. And he's a philosopher. Which good is, stuff. Which is always the, the balancing act we have. If you're going to go too hard to the Calvinist side, God creates evil. Yeah. If you're going to go too hard to the Arminian side, God's not even needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got to be somewhere in the middle. I'm going to quote attention. the taco girl from those commercials and say, why not both? Why not both? Is it both and or either or? Either or. <laughs> well, I, you know, yes. Coming back to this, back. yes. Garden stuff. When you get into the war, the fame guy, these guys got some serious theology about what happened Correct. in the garden. Who's it? When you, or the faith. When you get into the Joel and those guys, those guys got a smile. But they teach some nonsense. <laughs> so if you're teaching nonsense, you better oh, smile. Yeah. They, wait, wait, wait. They, they tell you that in the garden, thing. Adam was actually God. And then after Adam sinned, God got kicked out of the garden. And God couldn't come back in. Yeah, who was this? Wait, who's who's this? Who was this? A bunch word of, of faith. All those word of faith teachers. Yeah. Joyce Myers. Joel Osteen. Really? Now, let me think. You, you will find this is true. This is true with anybody, anybody in this classroom. Okay. Our thinking, our belief, is skewed. Maybe not on all things, but I'll guarantee you, on something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I hold Sproul, Ravi, Lewis, Chesterton, all at a higher level than mm -hmm. most of our pastors today. Yeah. But even they have things that it's like, hmm? <laughs> so it's like, don't take what is good and hold on to it. The other stuff, it's just a belief. Now, here's the, here's the key point. We're going to go back to our theology program. If it is not infringing or impinging on your salvation, be graceful with it. You're allowed to believe that. It's a predestination of free will. It has nothing to do with your salvation. True. Doesn't nothing. Change the commandment. It's a belief. Is it pre-millennial or post-millennial rapture? Who cares? If you don't believe in Christ, you ain't going to the dance anyway. <laughs> so, don't worry about the no loose account. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> as long as you get there. And read the word. Read the, the word. Read the word. through by yourself. Yep. For yourself. Or listen to it. Somehow or other, get it in get your into head. The word. Get it into your heart. Well, he mentioned True. the theology class, and one of the things that was stressed over and over was don't read a verse and go with it. Divorce from context. Read it within context. Read other verses that go along with it. Uh, and also, understand the, yeah. the times. You know, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, culture was much different than 21st century America. And so there's things that they did that we don't understand unless we understand their culture. Right. And there's things they said that make no sense in our time. I mean, I really struggle with Job because there, there's so many... Well, well, the very first chapter, how many times do we hear, well, God cannot be in the presence of sin? Yep. And yet the very first chapter, here's God and Satan having a, a little tea party, <laughs> chatting with each other. No, I don't, it's decent. I, I don't know how to... The Satan, I don't know how to actually. Satan. It's I'm the, sorry? It's the Satan. The Satan. It's, it's actually the river. It's... And the Satan was with him. Oh, well, okay, well, yeah. Okay, yeah. Whatever. Well, but I mean... But I, and, and then this whole thing about uh, Job didn't do anything wrong. And yet he's, you know... Yeah, but that, that concluded from this book, we're supposed to trust God in that, right? Yes, we are. I mean, right. but I mean, and I understand that. But what I, is the health and wealth gospel loves to quote chapter eleven of Hebrews, but only up to verse twenty-three. Twenty-four on, they never touch it. 
Why? Is that where they talk about being sawn in half? Yeah. Everybody suffers. What of those who suffered, endured, got sawed in half, were persecuted? They're in the hall. They're in the, they're in the faith hall of fame too, yeah. guys. Right. He he points out the ones that everybody knows, but there's others who endured and never got the caves and never exactly worthy of them. Exactly. Well, I, I heard a pastor, or he's a preacher, you might have heard of him, I've been listening to him, Paul Washington, okay. and uh, he made a statement the other day that there's people that nobody will ever know their name that are missionaries, and he said, I'm unworthy of carrying their sins. Yeah. Bob, Bob Carson um, did give like about five biblical teams about suffering. One of the teams he gave is that there's a such a type of suffering called testimonial suffering. I think Job fits that category. And Jesus, when he approached that blind man or the blind kid, the disciples asked him, "Why did he? Why is he blind? Is it because of the sin of his parents or because of his sin?" Or, and Jesus said, "None of that. He is suffering that." He might show my glory when I heal him. Yes. So Christians, sometimes the way we deal with suffering and the way we persevere through suffering, we become a testimony. Yeah. And God uses that. So you, y'all were talking about Joseph and, and the other guy, Daniel. They, they were really like marvelous testimonies. And so sometimes God challenges us to endure as a faithful soldier and try and bring glory to me by the way you process it, by the way you interpret it, the way you react. Yes. You know, I try and get better. Reflect on why I'm suffering and make sure, first and foremost, is there anything I'm doing wrong? As you said, is there anything I need to learn here? Yeah. And even if I can't find anything that I need to learn, I, 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 I pray more, I do more stuff, and then afterwards I just keep trying to be the best Version of Ricky, a yeah. part of the Holy Spirit that I can be. Yeah. Well, okay. and there's another aspect to suffering, and that, that's called depression. And I have always contended, if if you're depressed, go do something. Mm -hmm. Go go feed the homeless. Go go visit somebody in the hospital. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, when you get home that night. You are very unlikely to be depressed. Right. You, okay, so a lot of times we bring this on ourselves. Right. You know, just, oh, woe is me. Well, do something it's, about it. Yeah, you're so, right, John. If you if you go to the prayer meeting, I used to go on Mondays for a while. And I would go there and I'd lost my job and I wanted to pray and pray with people. Well, I'd go, when I came back from those meetings, my focus on myself was totally gone. I would hear things in those meetings that said to me, you don't have any reason <laughs> to, try. to worry about anything. Look at what those people are talking about. And then they give you some things to pray about. They hand you things, and when you read it, you're like, wow. Oh. Yeah, depression is a very, it's a very multifaceted thing, and it can be a number of things. It can be spiritual cause, it can be physical cause, it can be a lot of different things. No, I'm not making like a depression. And, yes. and we need to be no. very careful. No, I, but very I understand what he's saying. And, and, I know what he's saying. He's not making light of depression. Yeah. I, I'm no. not making yeah, light yeah, of it. Yeah. I'm no. saying there are there are some responses to it. No doubt. Yeah, well, and speaking of what you're helpful. speaking of what you're talking about, John it's, it's physiologically just getting moving, the endorphins will bring you out yeah, of the right. Right. True. Some, True. Sunlight helps a lot. Sunlight. Uh, experiential you, right? helping right. others right. helps you because it takes yeah. the focus yes. on yourself. When I go to the doctor, you tell them things, they ask you, do you need something? <laughs> they have a way of like to give you something from the moment you tell them you're going through trouble or uh, well, that's all I have a divorce. Uh, uh, do you need something? I said, nah. <laughs> That's why not. Yes, but you can't you give know. it to me. Well, you got. <laughs> Never mind. Thank you, guys. Very good, Steve. Thank you. Is Linda okay? Does Linda no, no, she, she's.